was a time here in the UK when Genesis was a completely unknown brand that only did a big saloon and an even bigger SUV, both of which had gas guzzling 2.5 litre engines. But it was a different time back then, a halcyon time. ABBA was touring, cool kids wore flared jeans and had mullets. Yep, all the way back in 2021. Indeed, hard to believe that only a year ago, Genesis came to the UK with just these two cars. Both lovely, yeah, but they hardly capture the zeitgeist. But the latest thing from Genesis, the GV60 here, really does. Because not only is it a premium family crossover, and that's a very popular segment right now, it's also all electric. So, from this to this in just one year. Yep, Genesis moves quickly. Speaking of which... <laughs> if I looked vaguely terrified there, it's because it's a bit wet, and as I'm about to say later, this does have some traction issues, especially when the ground's a bit damp. It is ridiculously fast, especially when you hit this button. Yes, this is a remarkable thing. It's not remarkable because it's really fast. Not all GV60s are really fast. And it's not even remarkable because it's a brilliant car because it's not perfect, as you're about to find out. In fact, when you consider that underneath the GV60 skin, it's basically the same car as these things, i.e. the two best pound for pound electric cars on the planet right now, in my opinion, it's arguably a little underwhelming in that context, arguably, but it is still remarkable because like those two cars, it's just really, really interesting. This thing has features many, many features. It can drive itself. And when you switch it on, this illuminated crystal orb spins around to reveal the gear selector. The door handles pop out to let you in when you approach the car with the key. And if you don't have the key, it's got facial recognition in the B pillar. Well, it can, turns out my car doesn't. It has fingerprint recognition too. Well, it can. Again, my car doesn't. It doesn't have a glove box either. It has a glove drawer, which is massive, and it stops your stuff getting all jumbled up when you close it. It has twin 12-inch display screens as standard, and they house some of the best, most intuitive infotainment software I've ever used. It has a floating center console that's not only cool and aids a feeling of spaciousness in the cabin, it also has pass-through storage underneath it that the rear seat passengers can use too. It even has a three-pin socket that you can plug your laptop into. It's generally just a really interesting piece of design as well, both for the eyes and the ears. That's because it has sound modeling, so you can make it sound like... I don't know what that's supposed to be, but it is awful. <laughs> and actually, the sound augmentation feature specifically is a great example of how cool and interesting this car is to play with and to discover, but also how sometimes it just doesn't work quite as intended. So with the sound thing, you've got a few options. One of them is a fake engine sound, and one of them's called futuristic. And you can adjust the volume and the sensitivity of it relative to the throttle all kinds of stuff. But you'll use it once, probably, be impressed by it briefly, and then you'll switch it off and never use it again. The same sort of thing with the seats. So they're active, which means that when you go above a certain speed, or you put it in sport mode, or you hit the boost button here, they'll clamp you in, right? It's a nice idea. So you get that sporty experience, you get held in place a bit more. But to be honest, after the first time you felt it, it's just really irritating. <laughs> and even though you can switch it off, as soon as you get out the car and put it back on again, it resets, so it goes back on, so you have to keep switching it off manually. Now, it might be that you can link it to a driving profile and keep it permanently switched off, but I haven't been able to do that or figure that out. But basically, imagine somebody giving you the gift of being able to run as quickly as Usain Bolt for 10 seconds, but then telling you that also, you'll have to have two ball bearings pressed into your temples Whenever you do it, probably not gonna bother, right? The boost function itself is a bit like that. So it's amazing and clever and dead novel, and you'll use it once or twice and think, wow, that's brilliant. But then after you've done that, you'll realize it's just a bit of a novelty. A novelty that will definitely wear off once you realize that while you're using it, you're draining more energy than Times Square at night. Thing is though, you might have the opposite view on that stuff. 
you might love it. But either way, this is just a really intriguing car. I hope I've got that point across by now. So intriguing, in fact, that sometimes the sheer volume and scope of its features can overshadow its basic function as just a family crossover. Thankfully, it is very good at just being that, just being a premium electric family crossover. This is one of the most advanced electric car platforms on the planet, and it's augmented by some really clever technology that's designed specifically to make it drive brilliantly in every which scenario. So the chassis, again, the same one that the EV6 and the Ionic 5 are on, can be rear wheel drive and single motor or four wheel drive with twin motors. So what you're looking at here are the three options you can have with a GV60 and each has its own spec. That's it, very simple. Pick your power and then the spec comes with it and then pick some options if you like. You don't really need options though because this is a very well equipped car from the base. But also it can get very expensive very quickly, this thing. And as I'm about to explain, I don't think you need your GV60 to be as mind-bendingly quick as this particular one is, Sport Plus. So you can see, as standard, it gets loads of comfort and convenience features and loads of safety stuff, including blind spot cameras in the instrument panel when you put the indicators on. Still one of the best things in a car. Plus, loads of things that you probably assume are options like a head-up display and wireless phone charging because they usually are options in other cars. And on the platform itself, the GV60 is capable of charging at insane rates, up to 350 kilowatts. Now, if that number means nothing to you without any context, here's the context. A charging wall box that you would have installed in your house will generally be about seven kilowatts. So the upshot is that this thing can get its battery charged from 10% to 80% in less than 20 minutes, assuming you can find a charging station with that sort of capability, of course. Now, the GV60 is not always the most efficient thing I've found this week. I've been getting about two to three miles per kilowatt hour in it, depending on how I've been driving, which in theory means that the battery range from a single charge could dip below 200 miles if you're not careful. But you probably will be, right? And anyway, this is not a car that you'll pick because you want maximum efficiency or you're worried about range. You'll get this because you're already sold on the whole electric car thing and you just want a premium driving experience. And that is exactly what this does. And it's partly because it's got some really clever technology to help do that. So as standard, every GV60 gets something called active noise control. And it's a really clever system that works in the same way that noise canceling headphones do. So in the cabin, six microphones, and they're listening to the ambient noise inside the cabin, and then they're canceling it out with inverted frequencies. They're piping that through the speakers. Now you can't tell that it's working. It's not like you know when you put noise cancelling headphones on and all of a sudden you feel you're in a vacuum it's not like that but all i know is that it's probably working because this is a very very quiet car it's even got foam filled tires as standard to reduce tire noise road noise and the wing mirrors are designed to be as non-whistly as possible and it's got insulated glass all the way around and of course it's got no internal combustion noise happening so you add all of that together and you obviously get a car it's just really serene, assuming you haven't chosen to pipe the fake sound through the speakers. Here's the engine one, if you're interested, okay? This is what an engine sounds like. Apparently. And that, my friends, is where the GV60 really shines, beyond all the headline features. Not the weird sounds, I can take that or leave that, and you probably will too, <laughs> but the general comfort and pleasantness of it all, I mean. Yes, in essence, this is a very lovely, spacious, easy to use, pleasant electric vehicle to be in. Ergonomically, it is outstanding. So you sit really high in this, you do feel perched into it, but it gives you this brilliant view across the road in front of you because the bonnet slopes down quite low. And much like the Ionic 5, and especially if you have it with a light colored interior, it just has this lovely airy feel. It just is very relaxing and pleasant. It just has that innately high-end feel in the way that it does everything. The infotainment, it feels like they've spent months figuring out the software and getting it right and making it intuitive and actually quite good fun to use. It's one of those systems that you play around with and you discover features through it. 
but also on a more basic level there are shortcut buttons and the aircon panel is separate so it's just intuitive it's a very easy cabin to get to grips with very good user experience and when the seats aren't clamping you in because it's gone to sport mode they're dead soft and comfy and shaped really well and of course because it's electric you get that responsiveness so it feels nimble it feels easy to control this car and actually it does feel quite small this thing i mean these things are all relative yeah but it kind of has the opposite feel to the ionic 5. so you're probably looking at this thing on screen and thinking it looks all big and chunky and unwieldy but in fact and it might be a bit of a trick of the driving position as much as anything else it does feel quite compact this the ionic 5 is the opposite you look at that and it looks like a hatchback and then you see one in real life and it is massive <laughs> practicality then so it's a little tight for headspace because it's quite low because of the styling but i'm quite tall and most people will be okay and legroom is really good rear visibility is quite poor though because it's got this big bar that runs through the rear screen it's a bit difficult to judge the back end when you reverse park in it also because the seat pillars are dead thick i know i say that all the time in fact some of my friends take the mick out of me for always talking about rear seat pillar visibility but i think it's important it's more important than door pockets right you're not going to reverse into a bollard because your door pockets are too small, are you? Also, another neat feature, it's got rear seats that recline quite far back in three stages and you can move the parcel shelf to accommodate that. That means that your children or less important adult friends can be just as comfortable and relaxed as you are in the front and your main friend. However, on the boot, while the luggage cover might be neat, a neat solution, not so neat is the fact that there isn't a single bag hook in there. Sounds trivial, but it's not, and I'm about to explain why. So you know the classic scenario, you're on your way home from work and you've got to pick up your tea from the middle. So you get your tea, you come back to the car with your bag for life. And with a hook, your bag is secure. But without a hook, you will almost certainly return home to find that your chicken nuggets, potato waffles and beans are strewn all over the boot floor. I do know that for a fact, because it happened. It's not a huge deal, really, but it's just an unnecessary annoyance. And in the context of a car that's otherwise so clever, it just feels a little bit off. Anyways, away from that little foible and back to the good stuff. Because however your potato waffles land in the boot, they are at least going to be comfortable. So the car I'm driving today is a Sport Plus. Top of the range. And that means it comes with something called Preview suspension. It's one of those camera-based systems that we're starting to see in a lot of stuff now where it'll read the road ahead and then it will basically tell the suspension how to set up to deal with whatever's coming for maximum comfort, in theory. Now, it's a great system, but despite that, I think that the GV60 here is just missing that little tiny end degree of luxuriousness in the way it rides over the road. It's a little bit on the firm side and it's almost as though Genesis just couldn't resist trying to make it a bit sporty. And when you drive it, you do find yourself occasionally asking why? Now don't get me wrong, we are doing minutia here. This is far from an uncomfortable car and it is far from a sporty feeling one. Most people will get into this and they will find it smooth and executive like and it's perfectly stable when you're cornering. It actually does have quite sophisticated body control this. It doesn't roll around a lot when you take a corner aggressively if you ever want to do that. And it's got a tight turning circle too. But by nature it's not the most engaging thing to drive. It's just not. It's not a lot of fun to corner in. It's a little bit understeery at times, and especially when it's wet, it just feels like the tires aren't that happy. It feels like the tires don't want to be dealing with this much power, this much responsiveness. You kind of slap your foot down in boost mode. It's a bit like that. <laughs> and then you find out that the Sport Plus model has a limited slip differential and a drift mode, like an Audi RS3. Again, you find yourself asking, why? Look, the bottom line is, don't be fooled into thinking that this is some sort of sporty crossover. No matter what Genesis might tell you, it's much better appreciated as a supremely quiet, very decadent feeling runabout. It's nicely specced, it looks great, and it's a rare and unusually styled family crossover SUV type thing. And I think that's why I would just prefer it to ride a little bit better tiny bit better just feel a bit more spongy maybe make the steering rack a little bit lighter not that it's heavy but i feel like i want this to have that range rover thing where it just feels like it's disconnected almost i've struggled a bit with this review to be honest with you you might be able to tell and it's because this is one of those cars that is deeply impressive 
really feature rich. There's loads to talk about. And it's trying to get that point across that 99% of people who drive this car will just think it's amazing. But if you start looking at it under a microscope a little bit, there are just a few things that you feel like could have been better. And then in the context of the Ionic 5 and the EV6, which sort of exceed where you think they should be, you get into those things and are just really surprised by how brilliant they are. I think the expectation of this is higher and therefore you expect a bit more from it and it doesn't quite reach it in some ways. It doesn't quite feel as luxurious. It doesn't quite blow you away in the basic stuff as you feel like it should, if that makes sense. Still, I love it. It's got character. If you get into an Audi Q4 e-tron or a Mercedes EQC or even an I-Pace to a lesser extent, they just don't have the character that this thing does. And nor will they have men taking surreptitious photographs of them in the street, which has been happening all the time in this thing. And also a lot of people asking whether it's a Bentley. Five times that's happened this week. Five separate people have said, is that a Bentley? No, mate, it's Hyundai. Uh, okay. How much? 75 grand. What? <laughs> and that's that. Brilliant, this thing. But is it the best of these things? That's the main question, yeah? If you're still here. Well, I would have one over an Audi Q4 e-tron or a Mercedes EQC. That's just my preference. And I would probably have one over an I-Pace, although I really like the I-Pace. I think the I-Pace is better to drive than this, more fun. Over a Tesla? Yes. But the only thing that irks me a little bit about this car, as much as I like it, is that it should feel like it's head and shoulders above the other two cars that it shares a platform with, the EV6 and the Ionic 5. And it is a little bit better, but it just doesn't feel that much better. Really doesn't. It's funny that because this is a premium brand, of course, and they aren't. That's the way I feel now. I haven't driven the other two for a while, so maybe I'll do a triple test with them and we'll find out properly, yeah? In the meantime, thanks for watching. Please subscribe. All the other stuff that I usually say at the end of the video. Bye.